could you please comment a little bit about the PI three findings in addition, either in metastatic disease or in um, adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapy? I know, Mark, you had mentioned something about third line after Fazlodex and, and uh, presumably, uh, uh, you know, using uh, CD4K inhibition. Um, are you getting that approved or covered by insurance companies in third line, presumably with Everlimus, but, um, and then, you know, there's been some discrepancies too. Neo Alto and Cleopatra showed that her two positive uh, treatment did not work as well uh, in neoadjuvant, but I think in a retrospective analysis of NSABPB31, they looked at uh, the effect of uh, PI3 kinase uh, expression in, in adjuvant treatment, and there was no effect. So how do you explain that? So there are really three questions in there. Yeah. There are really three questions. The first question was uh, PI3 kinase inhibition in metastatic breast cancer. Jose Gonzalga presented data at San Antonio on the first randomized trial of a thick BCA inhibitor in combination with an antiagen. It was a positive study. Um, so a significant improvement in PFS uh, by adding a PI3 kinase inhibitor and PI3 kinase mutant ER positive uh, metastatic breast cancer. Um, you know, we'll have to see, you know, where where that unfolds in terms of the magnitude of the benefit compared to CBK46 inhibition in the first line. Um, uh, and that's going to have to shake itself out with head on comparisons in the future, I would imagine. You know, in early stage breast cancer, what's clear is you probably don't need to inhibit every PIK3CA mutant tumor. It's the single most common mutation in breast cancer, and many of them are ER positive. And the early stage patients, we know for a fact, we can cure already. You know, if they're caught in stage one, even stage two, a high fraction are cured, and many of them do have PIK3CA mutations, and they're curable without a PIK3CA inhibitor. So probably not everybody needs one. And trying to sort out which ones really need to be treated in the future, I think, will be a challenge for early stage disease. In late stage disease, it'll shake itself out with head to head trials. There is a newer generation of PI3 kinase inhibitors that are emerging now that are subunit specific for the target, and those uh, are arguably, you know, at least in laboratory models, superior to the PAN PI3 kinase inhibitors that were the first generation trials. So that might be another future opportunity. The second question was uh, getting palbociclib approved in combination with fulvestrin in later lines of therapy. Um, I've never lost a peer-to-peer -peer argument with a payer on that issue. I have had to do peer-to-peer -peer reviews, though, um, but I've been able to win because it's published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a positive study. In fact, I haven't lost any of my palbo battles with peer-to-peer. Um, I've had to do some appeals of peer-to-peers that was denied the first time, and I appeal it and eventually get it across the line. So it takes a lot of patience. You have to be willing to listen to lots of uh, Muzak uh, while waiting on hold for the uh, doc on the other end to finally uh, pick up. But in the third line, are you having trouble getting? Uh, I haven't had trouble with Palbo in any line. I've used it in every line once the drug was approved. I started recommending it for everybody. And I've, I've argued strongly that merely not having had metastatic breast cancer, you know, at the time of the approval or after shouldn't be a penalty to not be, gain access to the class of drugs that, that are very uh, active, even in later lines, as the Paloma 3 trial convincingly shows. So um, it shouldn't be a problem. It's, the Paloma 3 is now a label indication anyway. So the that, mTOR inhibition is paid for. mTOR also. inhibition is a different story. I mean, uh, I use that in later lines simply because it does have added toxicities as compared to a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Um, CDK4-6 inhibition largely has paper toxicity. I mean, it's a neutrophil count issue. Patients don't feel that. So apart from having to come back and forth to clinic every two weeks for two months, which is a bit inconvenient, especially in a jurisdiction like yours where people come from uh, great distances. But even in your instance, you can probably find a local lab to do CBCs in the patient's neighborhood s somewhere nearby. So um, uh, whereas with mTOR inhibition, you know, there is significant toxicity that patients, you know, perceive. And so that's, uh, for me, for a palliative disease intent, that puts it farther back in terms of, uh, you know, when I tend to use it. Uh, the last question you asked was PI3 kinase mutation in response to HER2 targeted therapies. We just published a paper, uh, Jose Bazelga and I and others uh, in clinical cancer research a couple of months ago, 
where we looked at the Amelia trial, which is the pivotal trial of TDM1. And as predicted, PI3 kinase mutation uh, had deleterious effects to patients that were randomized to the lapatinib arm, clearly a resistance factor for lapatinib capecitabine. Whereas in the TDM1 randomized subjects, there was no difference in outcome whatsoever with PI3 kinase mutation or not. So I think the, you know, the ADC uh, class of agents may be able to bypass that mechanism of action, at least in the HER2 targeted space. Okay, Excellent question. Thank you. Uh, quick question to uh, uh, Dr. Paragraph. So, uh, uh, so the CDK4 and 6 inhibitors, uh, so would that cause uh, an issue that because it inhibits the cell type 2 and render cells to T0 on the intro? And so, how would you think about the relapse if you use these inhibitors? Uh, the, um, repeat the question. The question is cell cycle distribution following CDK4-6 inhibition and could that lead to relapse because cells become senescent rather than undergoing apoptosis or so, some other form of cell death? Um, you know, I don't have an answer for you there. There is a, there is a senescence program. There is a senescence program that's activated by CDK4-6 inhibition. That's probably largely its mechanism of action, as I understand it. Um, and yet, it can lead to long-term disease control, as evidenced by the metastatic trials. Now two large phase three pivotal trials published in the New England Journal clearly show efficacy. Now we have unpublished data from two other registrational trials that have had press releases saying that they have efficacy. Uh, uh, you know, uh, signals in pivotal registration trials. Um, I think the answer to that will unfold in the ongoing adjuvant studies. That's really where the, the you know, the rubber meets the road, uh, so to speak, for this class of agents in long-term disease control in an early disease setting, and can that affect, you know, a higher cure rate or not uh, remains to be seen. Yeah, a similar question uh, regarding the PARP. So PARP, you know, uh, involving the DNA repair, and so what about if you, how, how do you think uh, if you use these inhibitors and uh, that will uh, affect the chemo or uh, probably in rare cases the radiation therapy because those are, you know, DNA damaging compounds and, uh, and... I think there is enthusiasm to look at combinations of other cytotoxics and other DNA damaging uh, um, effectors such as ionizing radiation in combination with PARPs and there is, I think, a little bit of data emerging with such combinations. Um, but I see no yeah. reason other than toxicity uh, not to proceed with that approach because... Because that inhibition would affect the DNA repair. Absolutely. So you know, so combining a platinum with a PARP inhibitor, for example, is, exactly. a, is a attractive, at least from a ther theoretical point of view, and uh, I think those studies will yeah. get done. A, a quick comment to Dr. Uh, Mehta, and, uh, you know, I really like the, the term of, you know, different animal because if you, if you inhibit less CPR3 kinase and then the cell is shifted to, to the, uh, you know, the MAP kinase pathway and people know that and uh, started to combine the MAP kinase inhibitors with the PR3 kinase inhibitors again, but then that causes more problems of the side effects. So what do you, how do you think that can be countered uh, clinically? Can, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so, so, so you know that the comment is basically, you know, when you switch on, switch off one uh, signaling pathway uh, using inhibitors, then the cells adapt it to it and then shift it to another right. pathway to survive. And that's, that's a common knowledge already in the field. And uh, how do you deal with this combination of inhibitors and how that would affect the eventual turnout of the uh, patients? I think the, so far we have used our clinical judgment to say X, Y, Z has not worked, we'll use something else. <clears throat> uh, I think we have come to a point where these are the questions that the biology of a residual disease or metastatic disease will answer. My problem at the moment is even though we order it and we get the results, we're not completely sure what they mean. Sometimes they come back with a suggestion for using a molecule that's not even in trial for breast cancer. So it, it's an interesting time. I think one has to simply watch how the newer molecules evolve. But there's no question about the fact that the, the paper I talked about from Baylor, uh, which is being published this month, a advanced look at it suggests that it confirms everything that I was basically saying in my presentation, the tumor is a very, very fast learning uh, entity. And so whatever you use, even in endocrine therapy, whatever you use, the receptive parts to it get completely controlled 
but then the bad actors in the tumor take over and they basically that's what even comes back as metastasis so it's it's again what you see in the initial tumor and what subsequently returns at metastasis may not be completely identical um, and one has to if you have a triple positive tumor and if you repeat biopsy subsequently down the line the HER2 may be lost and you may be left with an ER positive disease so now the hairs are gone but this was a herd now the tortoises are slowly coming back can I just add yeah. to that that you know there may be a, an opportunity as a result of selection from selection pressure from prior therapeutics and endocrine therapy is a good a good example, you know, uh, an alarming fraction of patients treated with uh, aromatase inhibition develop ER mutations. And some of those ER mutants are actually susceptible to selective estrogen receptor degrading agents uh, like, like fulvestrin right. and in particular the Genentech selective estrogen receptor degrading agent in the laboratory at least binds to un four of the most common ER mutants uh, made as recombinant protein mutant constructs it still binds to those. So that could be a, a very important opportunity. And maybe for particular mutants that may not bind, you could think of making a new class of drugs for ER mutants, just the same as we do in non-small cell lung cancer with EGFR second site mutations. But the one scary thing I'll just add that was shown at ASCO is that among these patients who develop ER mutations following aromatase inhibition, uh, in about a third of the patients uh, in circulating tumor DNA, they had more than one ER mutation detected in the same patient. So that adds another scary level of complexity. Last question. So I have a question about palvo. You know, so I was wondering if you have a patient you know, that has progressed on palvo you know, kind of as first line, would you consider continuing that you know, in second line you know, and changing the partner? No, uh, there's no data, there's no level one evidence to support that. And in the absence of that data, I would not even try to do a peer-to-peer -peer argument with a payer at $11,000 a month to try to push that agenda. I, I do not use Palbo in multiple lines, and I, I, in the absence of data, I can't recommend it. And the ESR1 mutations, you know, would you ever check them? You know, are they Probably wrong? not yet. Probably not yet. I mean, I... I typically use fulvestrin in the second line as a single agent off study anyway. And in terms of available agents that might have the possibility of binding to a mutant, it's probably the best option. Um, whether it binds to all mutants, I, I can't be sure. Probably not. But it's not unreasonable. And then there's third line mTOR inhibition after that, which may or may not be as dependent on the presence or absence of a mutation in the ER. Yeah. Two questions for Dr. P. Graham from me. Okay. So one is, uh, last San Antonio raised an intriguing possibility that the high-dose dexamethasone we use either for um, anti-hematics or to obviate side effects of texanes may be suspending during those crucial times uh, immune therapy. So in a natural immune setting, do you think that makes a difference in terms of those who may be using that heavy dose of DEX before or after uh, every three weeks or so, or in dose dense every two weeks, and maybe setting those patients up for a uh, return of the disease. And the second question is, last San Antonio brought up the question of, if you could enrich the tumor with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, then maybe the PD-1 inhibitors might work. Any further work on that? So the first question of high-dose dexamethasone, uh, you know, clearly in the checkpoint inhibitor trials that are ongoing in metastatic breast cancer, the taxane backbone of choice has been the albumin formulation of paclitaxel simply to avoid that theoretical issue. There haven't been any randomized trials to compare steroids right. versus not, so I don't know how serious it is. Moreover, I don't know how important it might be in uh, other antibody therapeutic, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, scenarios uh, because antibodies also elicit target-specific cytotoxic T-cell responses. Raphael Kleins and I published a paper more than 10 years ago showing that trastuzumab in metastatic breast cancer elicits HER2-specific cytotoxic T-cell responses, and I, like you, would worry that could be blunted with sure. steroids. I, d I don't know, but um, that would be a, a kind of a, a check for albumin formulation in future uh, rounds. 
the second question was? DILs in the tumor, Yeah, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. I, I don't know whether uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes at baseline will prove to be that important simply for the fact that you rightly point out, and that is these cells are very dynamic and can move around in the circulation and it can change over time. And so, uh, although I alluded to the tumor infiltration in triple negative disease as a potential biomarker for checkpoint inhibition, it may not hold up. It may well be that these uh, cells are perfectly capable of infiltrating from the circulation. Uh, and so the baseline till infiltrate may or may not uh, necessarily reflect the potential for that tumor to respond to immunotherapeutic approaches. Thank you. I'd like to thank both speakers for their wonderful insights.